بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد uh, we will resume after our uh, hiatus of taking a, a break uh, resume our story of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the lessons and morals that we can derive from them and our last uh, halaqa we had talked about the incident of the boycott the incident of the boycott of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the fact that uh, for and again we don't know for how long a year and a half two years maybe even three as some people said but most likely lesser than that or maybe a year year and a half uh, the Banu Hashim took on a self-imposed exile because of the economic boycott as we had explained the boycott was economic the Quraysh said we will not, we will not buy and sell to the Banu Hashim we will not uh, marry any of our daughters or our sons are not going to propose to the Banu Hashim and so uh, in, in anger, uh, in self-righteous uh, anger, Abu Talib said, we're just going to leave Mecca. If you're going to treat us this way, we have no need for you. And so they lived in the valleys uh, that was owned by the Banu Hashim, and they, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, allowed them to eke out an existence with great difficulty, until finally we explain how other members of the Quraysh sympathized with the Banu Hashim, and they orchestrated uh, the annulment of the boycott. And uh, when this occurred, Abu Talib along with the Banu Hashim returned to Mecca. And this occurred in the 10th year of the da'wah, around two and a half to three years before the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The 10th year of the da'wah. Now, barely had they returned when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala willed for three great calamities one after the other. Three great calamities one after the other, each one of which was its own difficulty. We cannot say each one was bigger than the one before. Each one was its own difficulty. And these three calamities all took place in the span of two months. And because of these three calamities, this whole year is called the year of sorrow. The year of sorrow, Am al huzn because of the calamities that the Prophet ﷺ underwent. The first of these calamities, which took place around six weeks, some even say five weeks after the Banu Hashim returned to Mecca, was that Abu Talib fell sick and the pangs of death began upon him. It was clear that he was about to die. After he had lived a full life, after he had done what he could for the Prophet to support him and protect him, now the pangs of death came upon him. And that he eventually passed away in the month of Shawwal of the 10th year of the da'wah, in the month of Shawwal, in the 10th year of the da'wah. And we have a number of uh, authentic reports about his death. The most authentic one, we have a detailed paragraph in Sahih Bukhari itself. A detailed paragraph in Sahih Bukhari about the death of Abu Talib. Uh, and it says that when Abu Talib reached the nearness of death, when the pangs of death began upon him, the Prophet Sallallahu entered in upon him while Abu Jahl was there. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, O oh my uncle, say La ilaha illallah, one kalima that I will be able to argue with you in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kalimatan uhajuka biha indallah. If you just say this kalima, I have an excuse. If you don't say it, I don't have an excuse. And he was about to say it. He was about to say it, but there with him was Abu Jahl and Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah. And they said to him, Ya Aba Talib, atarghabu an millati Abdul Muttalib? Are you going to leave the religion of Abdul Muttalib, your father? And they kept on saying this to him every time they thought he was going to say it. They said to him, Ya Aba Talib, you're going to leave Abdul Muttalib's religion. And they kept on going back and forth until the last that he said, he is upon the religion of Abdul Muttalib. He never actually said, La ilaha illallah. And so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw this, he said, I shall continue to ask Allah to forgive you. I will continue to ask Allah to forgive you until Allah stops me from doing so. Now pause here for a while. The Prophet's role was to obey the commandments of Allah. 
And the general rule, all of the prophets, they don't just make up their minds about what they want to do. They have to wait for Allah's commandment. And generally, the prophets obey this commandment. However, the Prophet in this case felt so emotionally attached. He said, even if Allah hasn't told me to, I will ask Him to forgive you unless He stops me from doing so. So his emotion dictated to him something that Allah had not told him to do. And that is that I'm going to ask Allah to forgive you unless Allah stops me from doing so. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, مَا كَالَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ أَنْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ This is Surah At-Tawbah. Surah At-Tawbah that Allah says, it is not appropriate. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ And it's a beautiful way of reprimanding. Allah didn't say him, you, you say to him, you made a big mistake. Allah didn't say to him that how could you have disobeyed me? Rather, Allah said to him in a very gentle manner, ma kana lin nabiyyi. It is not right for the Prophet or for the believers that they ask Allah to forgive anyone who's going to hell, even if they're relatives. It's not right. I mean, you are the Prophet of Allah. You know that he didn't die upon Tawheed, it's not appropriate that you then ask Allah to forgive him when you know that he didn't die upon Tawheed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam desisted from seeking his forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also revealed Surah Al-Qasas at this time. And in Surah Al-Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يشاء. That you, Ya Rasulullah, will not be able to guide those whom you love. Rather, Allah guides those whom He wishes to guide. You, Ya Rasulullah, will not be able to guide those whom you love. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide those whom He wills. And in another hadith in Abu Dawood's uh, Sunan, uh, we find that it was in fact Ali ibn Abi Talib who eventually came to inform him that his father had died. So from this we actually come together that the Prophet ﷺ visited Abu Talib on his deathbed, but he wasn't there when he died. So he tried, he tried, he tried, then he went back home. Then perhaps a little bit later, Ali came and said to him that uh, your uncle has passed away. Your uncle has passed, meaning his own father. Uh, in another version, in Ammaka Dal, your misguided uncle. Now this is the son, and the son had obviously, you mean, uh, he felt more of a disappointment in his own father that he hadn't accepted Islam. So there is more harshness in Ali than there is in the Prophet ﷺ to Abu Talib, because Ali feels. Uh, you understand, and he feels a double disappointment that this is my father, and he didn't accept Islam. And so when he dies, he goes to the Prophet and he tells him. Your uncle, and in Abu Dawood's report, your misguided uncle, not even my father. Your misguided uncle has died. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, go and bury him. And Ali said, but he died a mushrik, meaning how can I bury him? He's, he's not a Muslim. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, go and bury him. And come back as soon as you have finished burying him, don't do anything on the way. Come back as soon as you have finished. So Abu uh, Ali went and buried him, and then he came back and the dust was still on his body, and uh, the Prophet ﷺ made a long dua for him, and Ali said that I would not give up all of those duas for this world and all that is in it. That the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him to uh, calm him down and to bring him uh, solace and comfort. Uh, so Ali ibn Abi Talib said that I would never exchange all of this for the world and all that it has uh, contained. Uh, in another version, and this is a version that uh, we have mentioned this story before, but according to some narrations this occurred right now. And let me pause here for a bit and say that as we have said many times before, these 13 years of Mecca, we actually have only a handful of incidents. We don't have that much. And to make matters worse, we really don't have a chronology. Unlike we know Badr occurred this year, Uhud occurred this year, Ahzab occurred this year. When it comes to the Meccan events, a chronology is very difficult for many reasons because we hardly have narrations. And when we do, one person is narrating one incident and there's no context to provide when it occurred. So, according to one uh, interpretation, and this does make sense, 
The famous story where the people visited Abu Talib and they begged him to prevent the Prophet from preaching no matter what. And Abu Talib said to the Prophet that, look, my people have surrounded me, what do you want me to do? One version has this at the beginning of the seerah. Another version has it on his deathbed. Abu Jahal and Utbah ibn Umayyah and Walid ibn Utbah, they all came to Abu, Jahal, Abu Talib. And they said, you are about to die, resolve this conflict now, or else it's going to get into civil war. And this also makes sense that they tried one last attempt through Abu Talib and the uh, condition was as long as he keeps to himself, we'll keep to ourselves. So fair and square now, enough is enough. Let him cut off from us, let him do what he wants. Don't interfere in our affairs, we won't interfere in his. We're not going to win over him, we're not going to kill him in your lifetime. Now that you're about to die, prevent a civil war by telling him to mind his own business. And we will mind our own business. And this is reasonable as well to understand this story as taking place now. Uh, and of course, as we have said, it, some people said the beginning of the seerah, they came. We have multiple instances of them coming to Abu Talib is my point, right? And it does make sense that before he died, they attempted one more time. And according to this narration, in fact, then when the Prophet ﷺ came, that was when Abu Jahl is standing there and Umayyah is standing there. And Abu Jahl and, uh, uh, attempts one more time through Abu Talib to prevent the Prophet ﷺ from preaching. Abu Talib says that my people have surrounded me. Basically, what do you want me to do now? Give them this one condition. Just do what you want, but don't interfere in their affairs. What does it mean, don't interfere in their affairs? Don't speak against them. Don't ridicule their idols. Don't say their idols are, are, are meaningless. You preach your own to your people. Mind your own business, they'll mind their own business. So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Am, I would give them, uh, Ya Am, I will give them this if they just give me one kalima, meaning one condition, right? The meaning of kalima means one phrase. If they were to promise me one kalima, I will give them what they want and I promise them that all of the kingdoms of the Arabs and the Ajam will be theirs. So Abu Jahl stood up and said, we will give you not one, ten conditions, ten kalimas, whatever you want. And this is when the Prophet ﷺ said, the kalima I want from you is la ilaha illallah. Give me this kalima, I will be quiet and you will have the Arab and the Ajam under your control. And this is when Abu Jahl said that uh, we're, we will never give you this kalima and then he tried it with his uncle. Abu Talib, that Ya Am, you say this kalima, and I will have an excuse in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Talib was swayed. Abu Talib was about to say. Uh, in another version, Ibn Ishaq, it mentions that when they left, he told the Prophet directly that I would have said it were it not for the fact that my people will accuse me that now they're about to die and I'm scared of death, I will accept it out of khajal, out of fear. And he has this sense of pride. So, all of the good things of Abu Talib aside, he clearly has an element of pure racism in him. It's racism, it's jahiliyyah, right? All of the good aside, he has this element of, I am better than all of these people because my father is Abdul Muttalib. And I am a representative of Abdul Muttalib and I have a legacy and I don't care what, I have to keep up this legacy. And this shows us that it's possible for a man to combine so much good and so much evil. Right? The only real crime of Abu Talib was this arrogance of pride, this ancestry. And he would not give that up even until death. Even he, know, he knows his nephew is truthful. He knows his nephew is truthful. And in his poetry, which is recorded in many books, including Ibn Ishaq's uh, seerah, in his poetry he says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ that I know that the deen of Muhammad, min khayril adyani, that this is the best of all religions of this world. malama, And were it not for the fact that people would criticize me, i.e. his ego is more important than the truth. That people are going to make fun of him. That you have left the religion of your father and embraced the religion of your nephew. Right? You have left your father, Abdul Muttalib. And you do, do you know who Abdul Muttalib is? We already went over this over and over again. Do you understand who Abdul Muttalib is? He is the legend of the Arabs. The legend. And this is the main son and the leader and the carrier of the legend. The eldest of the children alive uh, is 
Abu Talib. And so for, for people to say he left the religion of his father and he embraced the religion of his nephew, this was too much for him. And so he refused to accept Islam, even though in his heart he knew that his nephew is not lying. And he's witnessed with his own eyes the miracles of, so many miracles, of them is the miracle of the eating up of the treaty. Right? That we, we already said he challenged the Quraysh. And he told them that I believe my nephew, my nephew told me that the entire contract has been written up except for Bismik Allahum. Right? And he rested his entire prestige on that challenge and it came out to be true. And yet still he died without accepting Islam. Al-Abbas, the younger brother of Abu Talib, he asked uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, uh, Ya Rasulullah, هَلْ أَغْنَيْتَ عَنْ عَمِّكَ شَيْءٍ Have you benefited your uncle anything? فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ كَانَ يَحُوطُكَ وَيَغْضَبُ لَكَ He used to protect you and be angry on your behalf. Did you benefit him at all? He used to protect you and be angry on your behalf. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, نَعَمْ Yes, I was able to benefit him. هُوَ فِي ضَحْضَاحٍ مِنَ النَّارِ he is on the peripheries of the fire of hell. And were it not for me, he would have been in the depths of the fire of hell. That because of my shafa'ah, because of my shafa'ah, Allah has removed him to the peripheries. And were it not for me, he would be in the depths. In a hadith in Sahih Muslim, in fact, we have even more details that the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who is aqallu nasi adaban fin nar, the one who is being punished least in the fire of hell out of all of the inhabitants of the fire of hell, uh, meaning all of the inhabitants who will be there forever and ever and ever, right? All of the eternal inhabitants of the fire of hell. This is because we believe that. Those Muslims who shall enter Jahannam, and we seek Allah's refuge from ever being amongst them, those Muslims who shall enter Jahannam, their punishment will never be as similar or as bad as the eternal people who are in Jahannam. Right? They have a separate punishment completely. So, of those who are being eternally punished, aqallin nasi adaban is gonna be his am, his uncle, Abu Talib. And what is that punishment? Subhanallah, what is that punishment? He shall be made to wear sandals of fire because of those sandals, yaghli minha dimaghu. That his dimagh is going to be, a'udhu billah, boiling. And this is the lowest punishment of those who are eternally damned to hell. Nas'alullah as-salama wal afiyah. So this is what we know of Abu Talib's death. And there are so many lessons in the life and in the death of uh, Abu Talib. Of those lessons, we have to be careful of simply following what the people are doing. Even if those people are the majority, or even if they are our ancestors, or even if they are our parents. Nothing is more sacred than what Allah Azza wa Jal says, and what the Sunnah of the Prophet says. And those who follow others will not be excused on the Day of Judgment, even if those others were great people. Allah says in the Quran, we followed our leaders and our elders, but they all led us astray. What was the point of this? We found our forefathers in a way, and we're going to do this no matter what. And Allah says, What if I'm bringing you something that is more correct than what your forefathers were upon. Now, just because we're Muslims, brothers and sisters, don't think that we are completely scot-free from this. Many times, it is our understandings of Islam that might be wrong. And it is the understandings that our forefathers have given to us. That, oh, this is what my grandfather used to do. How can it be wrong? No, it doesn't matter. Your grandfather, my grandfather, is not an evidence in Islam. The evidence is what Allah and His Messenger say. Another very powerful message that we get from the story of Abu Talib is that indeed only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the true Rabb and the true Ilah, the true Lord and the true being who is in control of everything. For the Prophet despite being the most beloved creation to Allah, still he could not guide 
the one whom he loved the most in this world. The one whom he loved the most in this world, he couldn't guide him. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ You cannot guide those whom you love or the one whom you love. It's in the singular. You don't have that power. And if this is a power he doesn't have in his life, how about now? How about now to control the heaven and hell? How about now to dictate who is going to go to Jannah, who is going to go to Jahannam? Subhanallah, those groups of Muslims that elevate our Rasulullah to basically become a god, these incidents completely contradict that understanding. In his lifetime, Allah is telling him, just because you loved him doesn't mean you had the power to guide him. Allah will guide those whom he loves. And this shows us that the status of the prophets and the Prophet Muhammad cannot ever be compared to the maqam of Allah Azza wa Jal. Never ever allow our emotions to get confused in this regard. Because this is unfortunately what many Muslim groups get involved in that. They, they, they begin their praises of Rasulullah in a legitimate manner and then they allow those praises to basically go into levels of kufr and shirk. Right? And this is where we have to be very clear here. No. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ And another benefit here that we get is that Allah affirmed that the Prophet ﷺ had a love for Abu Talib. What is the benefit here? There are some extremist Muslims out there that say that we have to hate all the kuffar. Maybe some of you have heard these types of phrases. We're not allowed to love the kuffar. We have to hate all of them. And this is a complete misunderstanding of certain texts in the Quran and Sunnah. Complete misunderstanding. How can anybody say we have to hate the kuffar like this when Allah Himself says you used to love Abu Talib? You used to love Abu Talib. Inna kalatahdi man ahbabta. Right? Rather. It is possible, now when Allah says in the Quran that we're supposed to have animosity towards uh, those who have rejected Allah and His Messenger, we have animosity because of their rejection. But we can love them because of other reasons. We, c- we don't love somebody because they hate Allah and His Messenger. A'udhu Billah, it's not possible. Anybody who rejects Allah and His Messenger, we cannot have a religious love for them. And Allah says, لا تجد قوم يؤمنوا بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم إخوانه وعشيرتهم. You will never find people having wood, which is a strong love, for anybody who opposes Allah and His Messenger, even if they be their fathers or brothers or sons. Now we have those Muslims who have this message of Islam preaches hatred of non-Muslims. This is their message. I disagree. And they use terminologies of aqidah which I think they have misinterpreted, such as al-wala and bara and other of these terminologies. And this is a broader topic which we don't have time to get into now. But in a nutshell, the, to summarize, the love that Allah is talking about in these verses and the hatred Allah is talking about is a religious love and religious hatred. We have religious love for the Muslims, no question. And we do not have this religious love for anybody who opposes Allah and His Messenger, no question. Even if they are close relatives, we don't have a religious love for them. But we may have a natural love for them. Because they are father or mother. Because they are, for example, Allah says in the Quran, for the Muslim man can marry uh, a non-Muslim lady, a Christian or Jewish lady, right? And how can a man remain married to a lady that he is required to hate her according to the Quran? It's impossible, right? The love that you have for somebody could be natural. And that natural love is Islamically permissible. A father, a mother might be a non-Muslim, a wife, anybody might be a non-Muslim, and you have a natural love. But you are not supposed to have the religious love except for those who follow your religion. So Allah is affirming a love that Rasulullah had for Abu Talib even though he died a pagan. And this is important, that it is permissible to feel a natural affinity with people of one's tribe or one's ethnicity or one's uh, even nationality or whatever. There is a natural affinity and that is permissible. But it cannot become a religious one except for those who have the religion. Another uh, benefit that we get from the story of Abu Talib And I have said this before many months ago, that there is a wisdom that we can derive from the kufr of Abu Talib. 
that why did he have to be a kafir? And that wisdom is that the only thing that allowed Abu Talib to remain the chieftain of the Quraysh was the fact that he truly was a representative of Abdul Muttalib. And so, by being a representative of Abdul Muttalib, when he protected the Prophet they respected that. Had he converted to Islam, instantaneously his own tribe would have taken him out. And they would have said to him, we're not going to keep you as a leader. Because there's nothing that would keep Abu Talib then as the leader. So by allowing him to remain in kufr, indirectly, this was in fact protecting the Prophet and to spread Iman. And therefore we can derive a clear wisdom, yet at the same time, if somebody were to say, I understand this wisdom, why couldn't he have converted at death? Okay, fine, throughout his life let him be a kafir. Then on his deathbed, because he was so good, because he was a father figure, why couldn't he convert? This leads us to another benefit of Abu Talib's story, and that is, we will never understand ilm al-ghayb. Wallahi, we will never understand ilm al-ghayb. Our hearts might find something, but we don't know why. It's possible we like something and Allah knows it's bad. It's possible we hate something and Allah knows it's good. What is the wisdom? Why couldn't he have converted on his deathbed? What can we say? Al-ilmu Allah. And a part of having iman is alladhina yu'minuna bil ghayb. And a part of having iman is, as Allah says, la yus'alu amma yaf'alu wa hum yus'alun. They have no right to ask Allah at what He does. And Allah will ask them at what they do. And this is a part of showing servitude to Allah. We don't challenge Allah's wisdom. Because challenging Allah's wisdom is satanic, literally satanic. That's what shaitan does, right? What did shaitan do? I know better than you, O oh Allah. I know better than you. We don't challenge Allah's wisdom. We accept. We accept the decree of Allah even if we don't understand the decree of Allah. And this is one of those things that clearly Tawheed is understood through this in that what is the wisdom of Abu Talib remaining in this matter? In the end we don't know. In the end only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Another benefit of this and it's a very important benefit. That Iman, <coughs> belief in Allah is more than just acknowledging the truth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, and this is an, an, again an, a deep point of theology, but uh, it's one that needs to be said. The perception that some Muslims have. What is the definition of a Muslim? Somebody who says the Prophet is telling the truth. This is the definition for some people. But it is not. That is not the academic definition. Because Abu Talib believed that the Prophet was telling the truth. He has said so himself. He said it to him directly on his deathbed that I would have said La ilaha illallah, but I don't want them to criticize me. I know what you're saying is true, right? He's affirming that he knows the truth, but he refuses to accept. Therefore, somebody who knows the truth doesn't mean that that person is a Muslim. It's a very deep point here. What is a Muslim then? Someone who submits to the truth. Because the meaning of Islam is not knowledge, it is submission. That's what Islam means, right? To merely know the truth doesn't make you a Muslim. Iblis knows the truth. Iblis accepts everything in his heart, he knows it conceptually. Think about it. Does Iblis deny that Allah is the Rabb? No. no. In fact, Iblis affirms, Allah is my Rabb. And he says to Allah, Rabbi, Qala Rabbi. Iblis is saying in the Quran, Qala Rabbi. And Iblis affirms that the prophets are prophets. Iblis does not deny that Adam is a prophet. Iblis does not deny that Allah sends prophets, right? He knows this. Iblis does not deny that there's a day of judgment. Right? Allow me to live until the day of judgment. In fact, Iblis even worships Allah occasionally. Because he makes dua to Allah to allow him to live. Right? If he didn't worship Allah, he wouldn't make dua to Allah. Yet, is Iblis a mu'min? Does Iblis have iman in Allah? Obviously not. Aba wa wa kana minal kafirin. Allah calls him a kafir. How is he a kafir if he knows Allah to be true? and knows the prophets to be prophets, and knows that Allah gives life and resurrection. How is he a kafir? Allah says, Abba. 
He refused to obey when Allah told him to do something. He was too arrogant to prostrate. Right? And therefore, a kafir can be somebody who doesn't know the truth. A kafir can be somebody who doesn't recognize the truth. A kafir can, can be somebody who rejects the truth. But a kafir can also be somebody who knows the truth, but for some reason, whatever that reason might be, refuses to act upon it. And this gets to, to the very controversial issue. I'm just going to mention it, make your mind stimulated, but unfortunately I don't have time to, to, to whip up a nice uh, academic talk now. I give that in other places. But what do we say then to the Muslim who knows Islam to be, I call him Muslim meaning he calls himself Muslim, right? Who knows Islam to be true, but he never does anything that he is required to do. Think about the question here. The Muslim who know, meaning he calls himself Muslim, right? What is the difference between Abu Talib and such a Muslim? In that, they both recognize Allah is one. Abu Talib did not worship idols. We know this, right? Abu Talib did not. His, his poetry is pure Tawheed. He knows idolatry is ridiculous. So they recognize Allah is one. They recognize the Prophet is a true Prophet. But the both of them are refusing to submit to the laws of Islam. The only difference is that the one says, I'm a Muslim, and the other says, I'm not. And in fact, the one who says he's not a Muslim, linguistically, it makes more sense because he understands what a Muslim is. And so he said, I haven't submitted, so I'm not a Muslim. Whereas the one who says he's a Muslim is saying, I submit, but in action, he's not submitting at all. Right? And therefore, uh, and this is, I know this uh, is a deep topic, but uh, the fact of the matter is somebody who says he or she is a Muslim, but never, ever does anything of this religion. He doesn't pray, he doesn't fast, he doesn't give zakah, he doesn't do anything of the sharia of this religion. This theoretical saying, I'm a Muslim, is not much different than the iman, quote unquote, of Abu Talib and of Iblis. It's not much different. Think about it, right? It's not much different. And as for the ahadith, whoever says, La ilaha illallah will enter Jannah, uh, we need to understand this in light of the other ahadith as well. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah sincerely, whoever says, La ilaha illallah from the heart, all of these things come into play. There are conditions attached, right? Not simply verbally saying that, but whoever says upon it and acts upon it properly. This is the one who shall enter Jannah. And Abu Talib's story proves this. That Abu Talib had what we call theoretical iman. But that theoretical iman didn't benefit him. And in fact, one final point with regards to this issue. That is why it is incorrect to translate iman as faith. Because iman is not just faith. You can say Abu Talib had faith. Think about it. You can say Iblis has faith. Think about it. Do you know what faith means? Iblis has it. Because Iblis believes things to be true. But that doesn't make Iblis a mu'min. So Iman and faith are not synonymous. Faith is but one part of Iman. You need to have faith to have Iman, but Iman is more than faith. Another benefit from Abu Talib's uh, story is the danger of hanging around evil company. Because Abu Talib's final compatriots were Abu Jahl and Al-Walid ibn Utbah and that ilk. And he would have accepted Islam, he himself said. But those people and the ego of being around those people was too much for him. So one needs to look at one circle of friends because one circle of friends will influence him. Uh, a fiqh benefit here, a fiqh benefit here, that being a non-Muslim and dying as a non-Muslim doesn't mean that the Muslim relatives have nothing to do with the funeral. No. Ali thought that because my father is a non-Muslim, I cannot even do anything with the funeral. And so when the Prophet said, go and bury your father, the first response of Ali, he is a mushrik. And the Prophet said, I know he's a mushrik, go and bury your father. And therefore this shows that when a, non, a fiqh benefit, when a non-Muslim relative dies, one may attend the funeral 
and help with the processions and even financially contribute. But the condition is that you don't do the religious ceremonies. You don't do re the religious ceremonies. Now, uh, of course, uh, Ali was the one who was put in charge of the body, and so there were no religious ceremonies. But if there were to have been religious ceremonies, so in our case, if there's a convert and uh, a relative of theirs who's a non-Muslim non dies, they may go to the funeral, wake the procession, but they don't participate in the church services because that's not our religion. Let them do as they please, but we cannot participate in the religious services. But some people say that you're not supposed to go to the uh, funeral of a non-Muslim relative. This clearly clearly shows us that not only going to the funeral, he took charge of burying. He dug the grave himself and he put the kafan and the shroud, he put it in. And of course you put the kafan and the shroud uh, on, the, on, the, on the dead person even if they're not a Muslim. And so Ali took charge of this and the Prophet ﷺ corrected this misunderstanding. And this shows us the fiqh principle that you may attend the janazah of a uh, non-Muslim uh, relative. Uh, a, a point to benefit here as well is that uh, out of the four uncles uh, that, the, that the Prophet ﷺ, that witnessed the Prophet ﷺ's Islam, you know he had ten uncles total, or there were ten, um, uh, there were a total of eleven brothers, one of them was his father, so he had ten uncles. Of those eleven brothers, i.e. the sons of Abdul Muttalib, of those eleven brothers, seven of them died before the Prophet ﷺ began preaching the message. Seven of them died before the Prophet ﷺ began preaching the message. So seven of them never heard the Prophet ﷺ preaching Tawheed. Four of them. The two of them who converted and two of them rejected. Right? And it is just ironic or it is Qadr of Allah or it is a coincidence that the two who rejected, they had pagan names. And the two who accepted, they had beautiful names. The two who rejected, their kunyas of course were Abu Talib and Abu... No, not Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab. Uh, people always get confused, we've said this many times. Abu Jahl is from the Banu Makhzum, he's not from the Banu Hashim. Abu Lahab is from the Banu Hashim. Abu Lahab is the uncle, Abu Jahl is a very distant relative, don't get confused. A lot of Muslims get confused, right? Abu Jahl is somebody else, Abu Lahab is somebody else. Two different people, completely, and the Quran mentions Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab is the uncle, Abu Jahl is a very distant relative. Now, Abu, uh, Abu Talib, his name was Abdul Uzza. His kunya was, uh, sorry, Abu, uh, Abu Talib, his name was Abdul Manaf, my mistake. Abu Lahab's uh, name was Abdul Uzza. Abu Lahab, his actual name that Abdul Muttalib gave him is Abdul Uzza. And he was a very handsome man, and so they called him Abu Lahab as if fire is coming from his cheeks and face. Right, And so Allah mocked this name in the Quran by saying this fire is not just a metaphorical, it is a real fire. Sayasla naran thata lahab. Right? But they called him Abu Lahab because he was a handsome man and he was a, a single uh, son of the wife that Abdul Muttalib married. Abdul Muttalib had five wives. Abdul Muttalib had five wives and one of them gave birth only to Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab had no full brothers and sisters, right? So Abu Lahab's name was Abdul Uzza and he became one of the worst enemies. Abu Talib, his name was Abdi Manaf. And Abu Talib was of course the full brother of Abdullah. And for wisdom Allah knows he did not accept uh, Islam as we said. The two who converted of course are Hamza and Al-Abbas. And both of these names are their original names. And both of them mean the same thing. What do they mean? The lion. Both of them mean the same thing. Hamza and Abbas are two names for the lion in Arabic. They say that Arabs have 500 names for a lion. Uh, and, uh, and Allahu Alam, I mean some people have tried to make this 500 list but they've only gotten 150 but they have a huge number of names of the lions, right? Both Abbas and Hamza are names of the lion and uh, Hamza also has the connotation of strength and Abbas has the connotation of bravery uh, but they both signify the lion and for some reason the two names that are pure and good meaning they converted and the two names that are pagan names, Abdul Uzza and Abdul Manaf, uh, these are of course names of the idols, Manaf and Uzza, they did not convert. Whether this is Qadr, whether this is whatever, and Allah knows best, but this is a, an interesting uh, point here. Um, and by the way, of course, now that we're talking about the uncles, as for the aunts, how many aunts did the Prophet have? 
How many aunts did the Prophet ﷺ have? Meaning, when he was born, how many did he have? How many were the daughters of Abdul Muttalib? Three, three or four. One, three, four. Going once, going twice, higher. Eleven. <laughs> huh? Seven. Where'd you hear this from? <laughs> you just made it up. Wallahi, I know of six, but maybe there's seven. I know of six. Uh, I know of six, that he had six aunts. Uh, and we only know of one of them converting to Islam, and she is, of course, Safiya, right? We know for sure of one converting to Islam, and we know for sure that one of them heard of Islam, i.e. she was alive when Islam uh, was, was, began to be uh, preached, and this is Atiqa, who saw the dream at the Battle of Badr, which we'll talk about inshallah in a few weeks. Uh, that was Atiqa. We don't know who else converted. Some rumors have it that more than Safiya converted. Uh, and some have it that more than one died before Islam, but the fact of the matter is the rest of the aunts of the process and remain shrouded in mystery. We don't know uh, who amongst them converted, and truth be told, the fact that we don't know should seem to indicate that they didn't, because had they converted, we would have known about it. Had they converted, it would have been, and so the more uh, academically minded scholars of Sirah say that this means that the rest of them did not convert. We don't even know how many of them lived to hear about Islam. Except for Atiqa and Safiya, we don't know the rest of them, did they or did they not? Uh, but even if they did, then um, it's apparent that they did not accept Islam. Uh, a final issue about Abu Talib's death before we move on. Many of you know that some other groups of Islam consider that Abu Talib died a Muslim. And uh, I don't mind mentioning there are two such groups in our times. Uh, the one of them is the Shia. The Shia believe that Abu Talib died a Muslim, and if you uh, say otherwise, they are insulted by this, and they say that this is uh, a big insult. Of course, they are insulted because, from their perspective, they do not think the Imam's father, like, you know, they have 12 Imams, and all of these Imams, they go back to, of course, Ali. Ali is the first Imam. So for them, it is an insult that the Imam's father uh, would not be a Muslim. And this is a huge insult for them. Of course, in response, we say somebody better, even if you say they're Imams, we don't believe this, even if you say they're Imams, somebody better than these Imams had a father whom Allah says in the Quran was a pagan. And that is Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that did not diminish the level of Ibrahim, that his father Azad was an idol worshipper and an idol maker. It did not diminish the level of Ibrahim. So we disagree with this completely, and there's no textual evidence that Abu Talib converted. The second group in our times is uh, some extreme Sufi groups, and also in our times, some, uh, in the Pakistanis, we know some Barelvis as well. Uh, people like uh, this guy, Al Qadri Sahab, what's his name? Tahir Al Qadri and them, they, they, they say this. Now their reasoning, well, I, I, could not, I could not believe they were serious until I read this myself. I, I don't know, I mean, what can I say? They are my people, so allow me to make some jokes about them. But I mean, I can't believe somebody's mentality is this backward. But somebody says, one of these people says that because Abu Talib did the nikah of the Prophet ﷺ with Khadija, he must have been a Muslim or else the nikah would have been invalid. <laughs> That's his evidence. I, I don't know how to respond. I mean, you know, I mean, this is such an uh, 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 ignorant argument here. But these are major groups in our homelands of India and Pakistan, and they have this feeling that the one who does the nikah right for the process in the jahiliya days before the coming of Islam, how could he have been a kafir? He must have been a Muslim, right? So therefore, or else the nikah is not valid. And yani this is again, I mean, if somebody's using this as an evidence, but again, if you try to argue with them, they get very flustered and, and opponent. But uh, these are the two groups that claim that Abu Talib did not. Uh, die a pagan, he died a Muslim. But the fact of the matter is that we have multiple evidences, even verses in the Quran. Three verses in the Quran were revealed at Abu Talib's death. Three verses in the Quran. We have a hadith in Bukhari and in Muslim. We have uh, incidents in, in Ibn Ishaq Sirah. Basically, we have everything we need to clearly show that uh, Abu Talib did not die upon uh, Tawheed. Moving on, the death of Abu Talib was followed by another loss that was no less insignificant and in many ways even more painful than the first one and that was the death of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and Ibn al-Jawzi says 
This death occurred within 40 days of the death of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib passed away in the beginning of Shawwal. Khadija passed away on the 10th of Ramadan. Literally a one month and five days. Just uh, f less than 40 days had gone by when the death of uh, Khadija occurred. And uh, when Khadija passed away, uh, the Salah had not yet been revealed. So there was no janazah performed over her because there was no salah at the time. But the Prophet ﷺ took charge of burying her. He himself entered into the grave and he himself put her body there and, uh, and took charge of the uh, burial. And uh, a number of Sahaba reported that after the death of Khadija, we did not see the Prophet ﷺ smile for months on end. Yani after the death of Khadija, it was a very uh, traumatic loss for him. And there's no question that these two people were the closest to him. Abu Abu Talib is his father figure and Abu Talib protected him externally. Khadija is his wife, his closest friend, his first supporter and the one who protected him internally, the one who gave him support inside of the house. Abu Talib gave him support outside of the house and be, both of these two together proved to be a very traumatic uh, uh, time for the process and it is because of the death of these two that this entire year is called the year of sorrow. Meaning that he was uh, overcome by grief so much that the whole year was called the grief, uh, the year of sorrow. And the blessings of Khadija I have spoken about many, many times and I've mentioned, I've even given a long lecture to the sisters about the whole life and times of Khadija and how much the Prophet ﷺ loved her and how jealous Aisha was of Khadija even though Aisha never saw Khadija. She never saw Khadija but her heart burned with jealousy because of the love of the Prophet ﷺ uh, and even when uh, Khadija's sister Hala came uh, to Medina to visit the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, Hala knocked on the door and asked for permission to enter. The Prophet ﷺ was lying down half asleep and he jumped up and you could see the fluster on his face because he thought it might be like, you know, in that state he thought it might be Khadija. And Aisha saw this and her feeling of jealousy uh, went, you know, almost overboard. And when Hala left, Khadija said, uh, sorry, Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, for how long are you going to keep on remembering? And she used words that are not appropriate, but she was a young woman that was full of jealousy, uh, lateral jealousy, uh, an old hag basically of the Quraysh, whose tooth teeth have fallen out and whose cheeks are, she hasn't seen him, but she's assuming that Khadija is 65 when she's died. She's, mashallah, at this age, you know, 14, 15 at this age. And she's like, how long are you going to remember this old lady? You know, I mean, Allah has given you someone better than her. The Prophet might have overlooked the first phrase. But this phrase, he became irritated. That Allah has given you someone better than her. This phrase he became irritated. And he said, La wallah, Allah has not given me someone better than her. Don't say this, O Aisha. Allah has not given me someone better than her. She supported me when no one else supported me. You don't have that blessing, Aisha. And she spent upon me when everybody boycotted me. You don't have that blessing, Aisha. And she comforted me when the world gave me grief. Again, you don't have that blessing, Aisha. And, she, and Allah gave me children through her when Allah deprived all of my other wives of this blessing. Aisha said, after that time, I never opened my mouth about Khadija. Right? She learned her lesson. That she never opened her mouth after that about Khadija. And uh, the stories of Khadija go on and on. Uh, and uh, we'll just mention a few, a few more things and inshallah um, begin the incident of Ta'if next week inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and that is that when Abu Talib died, this, prov this proved to be a very politically difficult time for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because Abu Talib was his, in our times, visa or passport to living in Mecca. Right? Abu Talib was his protection. Everybody wanted him out. None of the elders of the Quraysh wanted him to be in Mecca. And so with the death of Abu Talib, he was in a very precarious situation. And Ibn Ishaq says that after the death of Abu Talib, the Quraysh could increase their irritation and their uh, persecution of the Prophet like never before. And another tabi'i says that with the death of Abu Talib, the Quraysh could finally come out what they were forced to hide in the time of Abu Talib. That finally the persecution could be completely uh, public. And many things happen here. Uh, and again, some of these we've already heard before because we don't know when they happened. So some scholars say they happen now. Uh, 
of the most significant things that really, if you think about it, this time seems to be more than when we mentioned before, is the infamous incident of uh, six or seven of the elders of the Quraysh conspiring to throw a dead carcass on him in sajda. We mentioned the story twice before, right? Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt and Abu Jahl uh, and, and Abu Lahab was amongst them. We mentioned the story before that when he went into sajda, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt uh, went out of the city to carry the carcass with his own hand. The entrails and the dung and the blood and the gore the, and the parts that are not eaten. And he brought it all the way back and he threw it on the Prophet ﷺ in sajda. We mentioned this before in early Mecca, but the fact is, if you really think about it, it makes more sense now. Because Abu, Lah, Abu, uh, Abu Talib is not mentioned as protecting him and there is no mention of reprimand. Right? And no one helped him. So what did he have to do when he stood up and the blood is on his body? That was when he said, Oh Allah, I complain to you. Because there's no one else at all. I complain to you. You deal with Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. You deal with Al-Walid ibn Uqba. You deal with Abu Jahl. You deal with Abu Lahab. Every one of them that he mentioned, and there were seven, ex exactly seven. Every one of them died within two, three years by the Battle of Badr. So in fact, this incident makes more sense now than it does in early Mecca, right? That this occurred after the death of Abu Talib when there's no one to protect him. Now, before this incident happened, in fact, there's a really interesting story uh, that Abu Lahab seems to have a soft spot all of a sudden. What happened was that in one a particularly severe incident, uh, one of the other Qurayshis, not from the Banu Hashim, uh, rebuked the Prophet ﷺ severely. And now, of course, you understand Abu Lahab takes charge of the Banu Hashim, right? After the death of Abu Talib, the only pagan son and the eldest after Abu Talib is Abu Lahab. So there's no question, there's no uh, power struggle. I mean, he's the only one that can take charge. Both Hamza and Abbas are Muslims. Abbas is very young, so there's no question he cannot be in charge. Hamza is senior. Uh, 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 Abu Talib, sorry, Abu Lahab is even older. So, with the death of Abu, Tal Abu Talib, Abu Lahab takes charge. Okay? So, when Abu Lahab takes charge and somebody curses the Prophet from outside of the Banu Hashim, he seems to get a soft spot. And when he hears this, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Ya Muhammad, go and do as you used to do in the time of Abu Talib. I.e., be as you were. Be as you were. What the, the privileges you had in the time of Abu Talib, you have them now. For as long as I am alive, you shall live in the same manner. So he felt some responsibility to protect the Prophet Sallallahu in a manner that his brother used to protect. Not out of love for the Prophet but as a chieftain of the Banu Hashim and as somebody who's taking over from Abu Talib. And this is amazing but simple human psychology that before you get responsibility, you can say things. You can brag and boast. But when you get those responsibilities, you act differently. You act differently. Right? And this is very common. Very common. Yani, the youngsters here, before you get married, you will say whatever you want about how you're going to be a man when you get married. Right? <laughs> and mashallah, when the woman comes, all of a sudden we see where that manhood goes. Okay? When you don't, I mean, that's a semi joke or semi joke, but when you, when you don't have the real responsibility, it's easy to just make perceptions of how you would do things. Right? Before Abu Lahab comes to power, he has this attitude that basically, if I could, I'd kill you right now. Once he becomes the chief of the Banu Hashim, what happens? He kind of needs to settle down. That there is a leadership role. And so he tells the Prophet, can you believe Abu Lahab? But not because he loves the Prophet, but because there is a prestige element. He is the chieftain. He has to guard his own people. And so he tells the Prophet as you were. Nothing more, nothing less. Right? Whatever Abu Talib gave you, I'm going to simply pass that on. As you were. And so, when the people heard this, they came to him and they said that, uh, in fact, uh, when Abu Talib said this, well, sorry, when Abu Lahab said this, the people spread a rumor that he had accepted Islam. So they came to him and they said, Asaba'ta, have you become a, Asaba, um, yani, have you become a Muslim? And so he said, no, but I am protecting my flock. 
I'm not a Muslim, but I'm protecting my flock. So Abu Jahl and Utbah, the two worst amongst them, decided to hatch a plot to remove the protection of Abu Ta Abu keep on saying Abu Talib, Abu Lahab from the Prophet. Right? So Abu Jahl and Utbah came together and they devised a plot. And they said to Abu Lahab, why don't you ask your nephew about the fate of your father Abdul Muttalib? The one that you're protecting him in the name of, right? Because that's the whole point, he's a tribes man. The one that you're protecting him in the name of, why don't you ask him what he thinks of Abdul Muttalib? And so Abu Lahab went to the Prophet and said, What is the fate of my father Abdul Muttalib? This is a trick question. So the Prophet answered generically, He is with his people. He didn't say he's going to, he is with his people. Right? And this shows the wisdom of the Prophet that you don't give incendiary remarks, you don't have to make it worse, but you cannot lie. He is with his people. And so Abu Lahab thought that meaning he's with his people is a good thing. He went back happy and he goes to Abu Jahl. He said he's with his people. And so Abu Jahl said, you fool. Where are his people according to the process except in the fire of hell? You, the, he is meaning that he is in the fire of hell. And of course, it, that was the point, right? That was the point. And so Abu Lahab felt such rage that my own father, you're going to say he's in the fire of hell and I'm protecting you in his name. Then he said, La Wallah, you are not going to be protected from me anymore after this. So after giving him protection, within a week, Abu Jahl had managed to get him out of it, right? Abu Jahl and his plot had managed to get Abu Lahab out of that protection. And so the Prophet was left without any protection in Mecca. And this was then what caused him to try his uh, Qadr, if you like, in the closest city next to Mecca, and that is Ta'if. And that is what we will come to, insha'Allah ta'ala, in our uh, next uh, week, insha'Allah, next Wednesday. We'll be talking about this, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, there's a very uh, a sad announcement. Do you have more details? Do you want to... Uh, How old is he? How old is he? 10 years young. 10 years old. Uh, what is the name of the sister again? Uh, sister Marvat. Uh, sister Marvat. Uh, the, the, the sister of Sister uh, Fatima Hassuna. Uh, Sister Fatin, Sister Fatin Hassuna, passed away today in a car accident, uh, and uh, and her son in the uh, in the car, ten year old. Do you know his name? Muad, Muayyad, Muayyad, Muayyad. Her son was also in the car, and he is in the uh, ICU, the med the med uh, center in critical condition now. Uh, the janaza is tomorrow at twelve thirty uh, at Masjid. As-salam, Masjid As-salam, the Jajan is tomorrow at 12.30 at Masjid As-salam. Uh, please try to be there and let this be a lesson for all of us that this sister was in her early 30s and she was active in the community, uh, Sunday school teacher. Many of us uh, knew her, many of our children studied with her in the Sunday school. Um, uh, to Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. Uh, complete instantaneous um, and to something obviously completely unexpected. Um, and at the same time it is also a good death when it happens suddenly because our Prophet ﷺ said that the sign of a, a good death is a sudden death. A sudden death is a good death. We don't want a prolonged death. We seek Allah's refuge from a prolonged death and we also hope that inshallah this type of death is also a shahada for her uh, because these types of death, uh, the Prophet uh, considered some types of deaths to be equivalent to shahada uh, and of them is if a wound uh, kills you and so we hope that inshallah this